everything is going wrong today okay that's why i'm having to use this microphone to talk to you face the camera it's why all sorts of other things are going wrong but i'll tell you more about those in a moment because they are relevant to this tutorial which by the way is about interleaved practice an absolutely magical way of practicing the piano which i think you are going to find super useful basically what it involves is working on music that sounds like this In order to help ourselves get better at playing stuff like this and maybe even stuff like this. Now the basic principle of interleaved practice is really kind of straightforward in that you take two very different types of music and you kind of alternate practicing them. You do five minutes of type A, then you do five minutes of type B, then type A again, then type B. And the idea is that by some kind of magic secret source, the kind of different characteristics of each style of music kind of feed into one another. Now I know it works because it's a technique that I've used for a very, very long time. The really interesting thing is that for a long while I did it kind of instinctively. It's only in recent years that I've discovered that it's actually called interleaved practice. I actually found out about it when I was researching my recent book, How to Be a Better Musician, which of course you can find out more about down in the description text down below. But that's what it's called, interleaved practice. Now, the very best type of piano music to use with interleaved practice is Baroque music. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at some Baroque style music and interleaving it with other styles, maybe looking at things like jazz, cocktail, a little bit of pop, stuff like that, and seeing how the two kind of interface and react with one another. Because you might think that the Baroque, which was kind of quote unquote classical music written between about 1700 and 1750 by people like Bach and Telemann and Handel and, and guys like that. You might think that is really unrelated to kind of pop piano and jazz piano, but it contains stuff that is deeply, deeply relevant to them and skills that completely cross over, yeah? So if we interleave some Baroque with some of these other styles, hopefully we're going to see big improvements. That's certainly an experience that I've had. Now, the thing that makes Baroque music so great for interleave practice is that the two hands are treated very much equally. If you think about a lot of contemporary music like jazz, then if you're playing a piano solo, typically what happens is the right hand is doing something cool like playing a melody or whatever and the left hand is kind of being the sidekick filling in the harmony and the rhythm that's an approach to music making that we would characterize as homophonic very broadly melody plus chords now a lot of baroque stuff is actually polyphonic so instead of having melody plus chords you have a whole bunch of different melodies all happening at once and working in counterpoint with one another yeah so here's a close-up of Bach's prelude number 19 from book one of the well-tempered clavier as you can see it's pretty complex it's pretty busy and both hands are doing a lot and that's incredibly useful because if we work on that style and then carry that over to playing jazz or pop then the skills we've worked on in the Baroque really you know will, will really help our improvisation in those more modern styles so what i'd like to do what i'd really like to do is teach you how to play some baroque music but i can't do that because every time i tr and i'm not the only person to have this problem every time i try to record some classical music on the piano and play it on youtube it gets picked up by the youtube copyright algorithm not because bach is still in copyright yeah not or handle or telemann or whoever but because uh, the content algorithm mistakes my performances for the performances of like you know professional piano players who have posted their recordings here on YouTube and that's kind of flattering great I'm being you know uh, mistaken for Konstantin Lifshitz or whatever but also it's deeply 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 annoying yeah I, I actually tested it earlier so I recorded the um 
probably number 19 from the Well Tempered Clavier and posted it on uh, unlisted on YouTube and Instagram thinking surely it's not going to pick this up surely the algorithm's moved on surely it will recognise that this is not another piano player but sure enough within five minutes it had flagged it for copyright reasons by the way if you support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Bill Hilton you can actually hear that performance uh, you know me playing the back because I, I've got it there kind of a bit behind behind the wall as it were so that's the problem but I kind of anticipated the problem I knew it was likely to happen so what I've done is write a piece of Baroque music I've written a two-part invention which is a slightly simpler form of the uh, Baroque style Bach wrote quite a lot of two-part inventions um, what they are basically here's Bach's uh, two-part invention number one, one in C major is uh, a keyboard piece not written for the piano because pianos were barely invented uh, by the time Bach died but written for something like the harpsichord and each hand has just got one part but the two hands once again are very very kind of equal so I've written a two-part invention which looks kind of like this it's in C major what we're going to do is learn how to play this invention yeah we're going to listen to it learn how to play it and then think about how you can use it to work on you know your jazz your pop whatever now what we're going to do first is listen to it through with the score on screen, the keyboard on screen. You can find the score with lots of other bits and pieces in a PDF that accompanies this tutorial. The link's in the description text down below. It's just a Google Drive link. You don't have to sort of sign up or anything like that to, to get it. If you are looking at this and thinking, my word, that is far too difficult for me to play. I've only just started to learn sheet music, blah, 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 blah. Don't worry, because I'm going to talk about ways you can make it simpler for yourself or isolate easier bits so you can still use this technique and still use it to work on your improvisation skills and interleaving and all the rest of it, but you're not having to get to grips with the more difficult aspects of this piece. So stick around to find out more about that. Okay, so let's hear it. Uh, invention number whatever it is. I've written quite a lot of these things over the years. I don't know. Invention number 17, let's say, in C major by M.W. Hilton with keyboard and score on screen. Let's hear it then let's talk about it and see how we can use it here we go Okay, so let's take a look at this thing. Now, like I said at the start of the tutorial, I want this to work for you, even if you're a relative beginner on the piano. So please don't look at it and think, oh, you know, oh my word, that's far beyond my pay grade. It's too difficult for me. Overall, it's not a super difficult piece. And if you've been playing the piano a few years and you can read sheet music reasonably capably, you should be fine. But if you are a relative beginner, I just want you to focus on the first four measures. Yeah, because they contain all of the kind of um, the strengths of this kind of music that we've been talking about. You know, the hands working equally together, doing different things that complement each other. Um, and really, the aim of this tutorial is not simply to learn this piece. So if you do learn it, that's great. Rather, it's to kind of use it for interleaved practice. So if you just focus on those first four bars and interleave them with some other styles of playing, that is going to do you a lot of good and probably improve lots of skills across the board. If you're a little bit more advanced, then go a bit further. Maybe go to the end of bar 11, measure 11, and that will maybe stretch you a bit. But if you've been playing a little while, if you're a competent 
uh, and confident reader of music, then please do have a go at the whole thing, because there are lots of interesting little bits and pieces in here that will test you and stretch you. Now, something that I really want you to notice is that there isn't a load of... Um, uh, kind of markings in here apart from the notes themselves and some fingerings so there aren't any dynamic markings there aren't um, any kind of articulation markings like phrases or slurs or staccato or whatever that is very kind of standard for this type of music so here's my copy of book one of Bach's The Well-Tempered Clavier and if you look at the score here then you will see that there is a part of my pencil marks it's pretty much the same. They're just the notes, some fingerings, and one or two like kind of footnotes, and also markings of um, decorations, which I haven't included any decorations in the two-part invention, by the way. Sometimes you get um, editors adding little bits and pieces. So here, for example, I've got the score of Bach's own invention number one, and an editor has put in some phrase marks and some little dynamics and bits and pieces like that. And especially in kind of popular editions of Baroque music, you will find that kind of thing. Uh, but in a lot of editions, you won't get it at all. Now, that's not to say that this kind of music, Baroque style music, doesn't use dynamics or articulation or whatever because it uses loads. It's much more kind of up to you to decide what you do with it. And often the music kind of itself tells you where to do different things, okay? This kind of music can be super expressive. People often think it's kind of robotic, yeah? And, and uh, often I think that's the fault of some performers, naming no names, who do play it in a very robotic style. But I think it can be super, super expressive as well. But it does mean you need to think a little bit about your louds and softs and your articulations. So if you want to, get familiar with it and notice where you are naturally becoming louder and softer. And perhaps write that in if you want to. Write in a P, write in an F every now and then. Um, and also spot the areas where you might want to speed up or slow down. So a really obvious place for that, I think, in this invention is in bars 15 and 16, where we have the hands coming together in scale runs like this, and it's kind of a dramatic moment. <laughs> And the little kind of motif comes there again in the right hand. So on, the, on that D in the right, I really gave it some... That's a real statement, yeah? Uh, when a lot of this kind of music was originally written, it was actually written for things like the harpsichord and the clavichord, where you can't easily do louds and softs, okay? That is not a reason for not using the piano to do everything it can do, yeah? So do use your louds and softs. Don't, you know, don't get into this very purist attitude of, I must play everything at the same dynamic. I must just play the notes. Also, you'll notice there, I played it around a tiny bit with the time. I, I kind of exaggerated a little bit. I, I think that's fine as well, yeah? Don't play it absolute metronome strict. Instead, use a bit of expression. Let, let, me, let me just do that again. <laughs> That was maybe a bit much there. I was kind of exaggerating it. You don't want to get, go really bananas and, and kind of get really lush and romantic with this music, but by all means, play around with the dynamics and the expression. Do not use, if you can avoid doing so, do not use the pedal. I'm not one of those people, I, you know, I'm hardly an expert on this music, but, you know, you do get some people who say, um, you know, never use the pedal with Baroque keyboard music because... Um, you know, Bach didn't have a pedal on his harpsichord or whatever. Fine, okay, it works best without loads of pedal. That doesn't mean you can't use a little bit occasionally. You know, there's no reason to be absolutely dogmatic about it. But for this, I would stay away from the pedal. All it's going to do is muddy up the melody, yeah, melodies. Um, a good reason, and, and, and this is one of the reasons why Baroque music often doesn't suit pedal, because we have lots and lots and lots of kind of harmonic changes. The harmonic rhythm is moving very quickly as the harmony emerges from the melodies working together. The pedal often just muddies it, okay? So if you are going to use it, use it very lightly and just a very, very little bit. When you're practicing this, I would start off practicing separate hands, but do, do, do remember that the hands are equal. One of the great things about a Baroque keyboard music is that it really gets you out of the, the kind of 19th, 20th century habit of thinking that the right hand does the melody and the left hand does the chords, because 
both are equal both are playing melodic stuff okay that is really good but practice them separately to start with and then gradually start to put together what i would do from bar 12 onwards if you get that far where we have that really busy left hand is get that left nailed down to start with before you think about putting the right on top so practice it for you really practice it through really quite a few times Notice the fingering that's going on here. I think I've come up with the most logical fingering. Um, and it's not actually that complicated. There's a bit of finger over, finger under, a bit of scrunching up your hand. There's not loads of finger switching, which you get in some Baroque music. There's, there's a little bit. So in bar 11, you come onto the F in the left hand and switch to a fifth, so it's easy to reach up to the F at the top there. If you've got big hands, you might not even need to do that. but. I would tend to do that because my hands are quite small. Um, but do pay attention to the fingering. Yeah, that, that's a really important part of it. Often when you're practicing slowly, it's tempting to kind of fudge the fingering or ignore it. But then what you find is that as you speed up, things start to come unstuck. So work on the fingering right from the start. In general, the point of practicing this piece is to practice it okay that's the whole point of interleave practice if you never achieve perfection with this that's not a big deal if you do that's great maybe you'll end up performing it better than me <laughs> that would be really cool um and if you do pl please post the performance somewhere online so, and, and, and tag me so i can have a listen um but the aim here is to practice carefully and thoroughly and interleave with other stuff now how do you do that well that's what we're going to be talking about next by the way, if you're a regular watcher of the channel, you probably already know that this is what I do for a living. And what kind of pays for it, what kind of pays the bills and feeds my children and stuff is advertising revenue and revenue from Patreon and revenue from sales of my various books. So if you want to keep the Hilton show on the road, why not check out some of the stuff that I've got on offer? All the links are down below in the description text. You could check out my piano packs, which are PDF packs full of exercises and pieces to learn with walkthrough videos. You could check out my various ebooks which are available together in a bundle my th my three kind of previous ebooks you can buy as a bundle all down in the description text below you can check out my new book how to be a better musician which you can apply to any instrument not just the piano or you could sign up to support me on patreon um, if you sign up and support me on patreon it doesn't have to cost you very much you get all of the piano packs as part of that deal and you're also going to get access early access to my new project which is called exercises inventions and ideas which is going to be kind of like the piano packs it's going to be be different exercises and, and bits and pieces to learn and practice techniques uh, that eventually are going to be um, wrapped together into a book I think but I'm going to release them kind of in tranches to my Patreon supporters so if you're a Patreon supporter you get early access to these probably uh, maybe early access by like a year to 18 months it's kind of probably going to be a while before I get it out so there we go check out all that stuff I would really appreciate it if you would so now let's have a think about how you can make interleaved practice work for you. I'm going to be thinking about it in terms of using our Baroque piece, our two-part invention, as the A piece, and then as the B piece, some kind of improvisation. I'm going to think about how we can use this to improve our playing in a couple of different improvisatory styles. Now, a really important point, interleave practice works for other things apart from just improvisation, yeah? So you can use two contrasting pieces of classical music. You can use two contrasting pieces of jazz as your A and B. I'm just using the baroque versus the two styles i'm going to cover jazz and pop very very broadly uh, because those are the ones that i use most commonly and which i think you the, the kind of regular viewers of my channel will probably be most interested in so first of all let's imagine that we're working very 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 broadly in the kind of jazz tradition that might be jazz it might be blues it might be cocktail whatever let me just play through the first few bars of a chord progression of a type that you might be working on. If this is really new to you, don't worry about it. I'm not going to try to teach you improvisation here, but in the PDF, there will be a bunch of resources about you know how you can get started with this kind of thing if it's really new to you. What I want you to do for now is just to look at the differences between what my two hands are doing and how they relate to one another, because this is where our interleave practice is really going to help us.
very, very kind of rough and ready there. But what I was kind of playing there was very typical of the way things often work in that kind of style. Yeah, there are massive exceptions. It's a huge generalization. But in general, my right hand was quite melodic. There was a lot of movement going on in my right hand. And my left hand was backing up what was going on in the right. In general, there was less movement in the left than in the right. Like I said, there are exceptions. Sometimes you might play a stride style where there's a lot of movement going on. You might have a kind of boogie woogie style. Even so, in these kind of styles, the left hand tends to be relatively static compared to the much larger amount of motion in the right hand okay if you're if you're comping if you're accompanying that might be less the case you might be playing more chordally but if you're playing some sort of piano solo then what we typically have is melodic type stuff in the right and accompaniment harmony rhythm all the kind of backup stuff in the left so very typical of that homophonic style now when you are beginning to learn the piano and especially if you are a self teacher that is very much the kind of style that it's easy to get kind of trapped in because you want to start off playing your favorite songs whatever genre they are and what you tend to do is play that kind of quite static style in the left chords with uh, more more movement and melody in the right and that means you can get in a situation where um the right hand is stronger than left and the, the left the classic problem of people starting out with jazz blues cocktail whatever is a weak left hand or not knowing what to do with the left hand now into leaving here can really help because as we saw when we were working on the two-part invention it gets your left hand working much more the right hand does its thing and then the left hand does its thing which is very similar if not identical okay so interleaving that against your jazz blues cocktail kind of improvisation can really help strengthen up your left hand in the jazz blues cocktail stuff but also get your mobility going in the right hand because baroque is often quite um often demands a lot of de dexterity it really challenges your finger ability and, and helps you practice things like finger switching and stuff which can be useful in the right hand so how would i interleave these two things together well the first thing i would do and this is true of all interleave practice I would make sure that both pieces, for want of a better word, you know, one of them might be a song, but I'm going to call them both pieces. I would make sure that both pieces were at least somewhat off the ground and I was at least somewhat confident with both, in that I could just about hack through them, yeah? And none of them were giving me real major problems that made me stop and think and work out what the notes were, okay? Um, both of them might be really kind of rough and ready. I might be playing them really slowly, but I could at least do them, okay? If you're not at that stage with either of the things you're going to interleave yet, focus on them individually kind of half an hour at a time or whatever and get them up to that level before you start interleaving, okay? Because otherwise you're not really going to get the benefit. What I would tend to do is go through the um, Baroque piece a couple of times and focus on, when I'm doing my interleaving, focus on playing it beginning to end. During other practice sessions, I might use more standard practice techniques of isolating problems, focusing on problems, you know, dealing with that kind of thing. But when I'm interleaving, I would typically focus rather more on playing the thing through. That's not to say that I'm ignoring problems. I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily not stopping to deal with problems, but I'm looking at the whole thing. This is why it's always good to have things that are relatively short, okay? So I maybe work on that a couple of times and then I will work on the jazz progression a couple of times. Again, I would try to get through it rather than, you know, digging into individual little, little, little bits. It's really important to stress that, you know, this is why interleaving shouldn't be your only form of practice because you do also need to practice things in that very kind of, as I call it, in, especially in how to be a better musician when I talk about this sort of stuff, when I talk about practice techniques, what, what I call that kind of attack the problem mentality where you just focus in for, on a bar or two that's giving you difficulties. You need to retain that kind of standard practice. But when you're interleaving, go through each one a couple of times and see if it helps. As a general tip, something that you might find helps, I've, I've done two things in different keys here. Something that you might find helps is to, 
to choose an A and a B piece that are in the same key, or maybe in relative major and minor, so, so, so in each other's relative key, so maybe one in C, one in A minor, whatever. But that is roughly how I would do it. Um, what about if I were doing um, something a bit more poppy, a bit more ballady, yeah? Um, rather than playing a jazz progression, but by the way, I'll put some information about that jazz progression that I was using in the PDF. Let's imagine that we were doing a kind of pop or ballad style improvisation using the chord progression of Pakel Bell's Canon in D, which is a really old piece of music, but which gets used in a lot of pop songs. So think of songs like... Um, if you know Memories by Maroon 5, if you know Don't Look Back in Anger by Oasis, they use this progression. It's not quite as common as the 1564 progression, which I talk about a lot, but it still gets used a fair bit. Let me just improvise through it a couple of times so you can get a sense of how it's working. Again, if this progress if this style is new to you, don't worry. There are um, you know, kind of starting points included in the, P in the PDF. Once again, what I want you to do is not so much focus on the notes I'm playing as look at what my hands are doing in relation to one another. Okay, here we go. Okay, very kind of typical slow ballad technique I was using there, using a lot of pop piano techniques, kind of rhythmic anticipation in the right hand, bringing in the chord a little bit ahead of the beat, doing things like suspensions. Okay, so there's a D chord, but suspending the E, holding up to the F sharp, that kind of thing. Now, one interesting thing about this style, which has a lot of roots in church music. This is something I've talked about in the past, um, and it has more of a kind of thread connecting it to Baroque music, actually, and um, we'll, we'll not kind of get into the musicology of, of that here. But look how it contrasts a little bit, well, more than a little bit, really, with the kind of very homophonic jazz style I was playing, in that the two hands were working rather more closely together. Now, that happens in a couple of ways. It happens often in a rhythmic way, where you kind of have a kind of percussive thing going on in a lot of pop piano. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of rocking between the two hands going on there. But also when you're playing more kind of ballady styles, often the left hand is working in a much more kind of complementary way to the right hand, yeah? Just have a look again. I'll, I'll try to kind of exaggerate it a little bit this time. So I was putting in some little broken chords there, I was coming up to the sixth of the chord a couple of times, and in general the left hand, although the right hand was still making most of the play, the left hand was kind of complementing it more, it was filling in more, it was adding little bits of broken chords, it, it, it was kind of adding to the music um, in, in a very definite way, yeah? If it had been a much more static left hand, the piece would kind of very much have lost its character. Yeah, so there's much more of a relationship between the two hands. Now, you can probably see how interleaving with Baroque stuff would really, really help here, because in the Baroque, our left hand really, really gets going, okay? It's really active. And getting into this kind of pop piano style needs an active left hand, and it's something that people often struggle with, because like I said, self-teachers especially often start with melodic right hand, chords in the left hand, but once they, they kind of want to get going with this kind of thing, the left hand lags. So once again, interleaving, two or three times through the Baroque music and two or three times through your chord progression, whether it's, you know, the canon in D or whatever, is going to improve both, okay? And in particular, with the pop progression, it's going to get your left hand moving. Once again, you might try using stuff in similar keys and so on and so forth. Have a go at it for yourself and see how you get on. Like I said, mo and, and this is really important, try to have both pieces you're working on, the A piece and the B piece, at least a little bit off the ground, or you're just going to get bogged down in trying to learn them, yeah? And once again, really important, 
Don't do this all the time because you need to practice in more traditional ways as well to move forward, but you will find that doing it every now and then really brings on your improvisation in particular. Okay, there we go. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know how you get on. I'm trying to produce more and more stuff that is focused on the needs of the people that I know are watching this channel. People are really working hard to improve your piano skills. You know, maybe you're just starting out, maybe you're struggling, maybe you're a bit older. I'm particularly interested in the needs of older learners, so do let me know. I've been talking about that a lot recently. Subscribe to my channel if you're not subscribed already. Follow me on social media, all of the usual stuff. And don't forget to check out my products. All the links are in the description text down below. Anyway, there we go. Happy piano playing. I'll see you next time.